previously on All Things Unexplained. We have author of the new book, The Cosmos Explained, host of the podcast Into the Luniverse. He's an associate in astrophysics at the American Museum of Natural History, a professor, a talented singer, which we have proof of from earlier tonight, co-author along with Neil deGrasse Tyson and Robert Arion of the book One Universe at Home and the Cosmos. It's Dr. Charles Wilk. Holes don't suck, but if you fall in one, then that's your new home. No, they don't suck, they don't suck, they don't suck, they don't suck, no, they don't. But if you fall in one, then that's your new home. Black holes don't suck. But if you fall in one, then that's your new home. No. no. Want to join in? Want to join in? They, they don't suck. They don't suck. They don't suck. They don't suck. No, they don't. They don't. No. <laughs> but if you fall in one, then that's your new home. Hooray! <laughs> All Things Unexplained, hosted by Dr. Mounts. Let's face it, we were always ready to roll without him anyway. (laughs) C.J. Derringer. Ain't nobody perfect, right? And Smitty Neves. I've never planned out hardly anything my whole life. I just free ball. Featuring Cajun Man. I'm just old nobody, somebody looking for somebody. Black holes don't suck. If you get to the event horizon, you're stuck there. And I've heard Dr. Neil deGrasse Tyson use the term spaghettified, spaghettified several times about once you enter a black hole. What does happen, or at least what do we think happens when you get to that event horizon? Mm, great question. Great, great question. So the term spaghettification was coined by Sir Martin Rees, who was the astronomer royal uh, in the UK back in the 1990s. Brilliant man and and a great communicator. He wrote a whole bunch of books about uh, cosmology and stuff because he was a theoretical cosmologist. Uh, When black holes spaghettify you, it's because when you get close to the center of mass of an object, that the tip of your nose is actually being accelerated by gravity faster than the back of your head. And as a result, you get stretched out like a noodle, okay? So it depends on how big or how massive the black hole is that that differential pull, right? That tidal difference uh, is that it depends on the strength. So if it's a black hole, say the size of uh, a city or the size of the earth, all right? Then the tidal pull is very, very strong and you get basically pulled into a stream of atoms. I like to think uh, as if you were being extruded from a tube of toothpaste. Uh, so that's pretty, it's pretty dramatic. But supermassive black hole. It's graphic, yeah. yeah. <laughs> when you have a supermassive black hole, millions of times the mass of the sun, something like the supermassive black hole in the middle of our Milky Way galaxy, it's called Sagittarius A star. It turns out that the event horizon, the point of no return of the black hole is actually millions of miles away from the center of mass of the black hole. So the tidal effects that your nose feels compared to the back of your head is actually not that great. So your bodily integrity might actually stay a little bit better than you would otherwise have stayed when you're uh, coming into a smaller black hole. And so what happens then? you actually start to feel the gravitational distortion of space and time as you're going in. So you are, you are coming into the black hole and you're just humming along, 
black holes don't <laughs> suck, you know, like that. But somebody outside watching you will actually see you start slowing down. Black holes don't suck, <laughs> but if you fall, you know, like that. So, so basically, your time is being distorted. You experience time compared to the rest of the universe beyond the black hole at a different rate. And what will happen is the light that comes off of your body, okay, let's say I'm, I'm wearing some sort of a blue shirt, the, the light will start getting stretched as well. A regular blue light wavelength will get stretched toward the red. Red light will be stretched toward the infrared. You'll essentially become invisible as the radiation off of your body gets stretched to infinite wavelengths. And then you fade away, you touch the event horizon of the black hole, and the black hole literally rises to meet you. You become one with the black hole at the event horizon, and you never actually even enter it. As far as you know, that black hole might even be hollow. But when you reach the end, time stops flowing for you. Wow. You can no longer see or sense or see anything that's going on in front of you or behind you. Instead, you have just become one with this amazing object in the universe. Okay, well, that answers Jason Stifler's question. Does time stop in a black hole or is it considered infinite time once you are in a black hole? Right. That's a great question. And, and we, if, if we think mathematically, we do not know how time works inside a black hole. We only know that time stops at the edge of the black hole. Inside the black hole, there might be a whole nother dimension we would consider to be like time that we are thinking about, right? But that dimension is not something we can measure because no information from inside the event horizon can come out unadulterated from the inside, outside, outward. Wow. You know, we're speaking to Dr. Charles Liu, author of The Cosmos Explained. You can pick this up on Amazon, host of the Lunaverse podcast. Dr. Liu, one thing I've noticed since the singularity and throughout all of astrophysics and including black holes, the speed of light seems to play a critical role in everything why why is this hmm well albert einstein codified this in his special theory of relativity back in 1905 what people were noticing was that light simply behaves differently from other kinds of particles uh things like protons and neutrons and electrons they have a certain way of behaving and as a result, they change over time. You can actually see them evolve in not, not like Darwinian evolution, but change based on the environment that they experience. But light, turns out, does not really experience time as we understand it. A photon, a par particle of light or a wave of light, once it is emitted, it goes and goes and goes and it doesn't change. Once it hits something, it doesn't change as it's so much it's destroyed and is recreated again in a different way, either with a different wavelength or a different frequency or something like that. And so light speed is as fast as something can go because it has no mass. Uh, anything that has mass cannot go as fast as the speed of light. And because light has no mass, it is the speed limit of anything moving from one part of the universe to the other. The universe itself can actually, ironically, expand faster than the speed of light. The, the space in space-time can go faster than light, but matter in space-time cannot. All right. Well, I could ask you a thousand more questions and have a conversation for another six hours, but I want to respect your time and everybody else's time. And Tim and Smitty have some fun things they're going to dive into. But before we do that, we'll take some listener questions. Um, everybody that's listening, please do go get yourself a copy of The Cosmos Explained. It is phenomenal. You will not be disappointed, I assure you. Let's start with listener Willie Mounts, also known as Anonymous Brother. <laughs> do you believe... God created the heavens and the earth perhaps through the Big Bang? Great question. 
I do not know. Uh, even um, Georges Lemaitre, the scientist mathematician I mentioned earlier that was first conceived of the idea of the Big Bang, was very clear in saying he did not know whether or not a god or many gods or some non-natural or supernatural creature or being was behind the Big Bang, the creation of the universe as we understand it. Uh, in other words, my personal belief um, doesn't extend uh, from the science realm into the religious realm. I believe that science and non-science can coexist without any conflict. And the only conflict is created when people want to use one or the other to exert some sort of social influence. So um, God could have created the universe. God could have had nothing to do with the universe's creation. But in either sense, um, I'm okay with whatever the result is. Great answer. This next listener question comes from listener Trent Leonard, Dr. Lou, and you had so many great illustrations in your book that dealt with this, the expanding universe and, you know, how far out our senses can reach and what's beyond. Listener Trent Leonard wants to know, okay, universe growth is expanding faster, but what is past that? Right. What's it expanding into? We're pretty sure that whatever it's expanding into, it's not more universe. In other words, we are in a four-dimensional space-time, right? We have three dimensions of space, length, width, and height, plus this dimension of time that we're traveling through. When the universe is expanding, it must be expanding into something that has additional dimension, okay? It could be, for example, this uh, five-dimensional membrane to which um, I referred to earlier the randall Sundrum theory, which has sort of tried to explain that our universe is connecting to five-dimensional structures, and thus we wind up being a four-dimensional space-time that sort of bridges the gap between them. Uh, another idea which has recently come about, and people are trying to work this out, and I'm sorry if I'm belaboring this point, it's playing back into uh, multiverses, uh, but this is <laughs> an idea that has come about we were trying decades ago, maybe 50-ish years ago as scientists, not me because I was you know, not around, but uh, people were trying to figure out certain aspects of the geometry of the universe. Why was it the way it is? And by doing that, people came up with an idea that at one point very early in the universe, right around that quadrillionth of a quadrillionth of a second uh, moment, the universe for some reason didn't just expand, but it inflated. So for a moment, instead of a regular kind of expansion, it went whoosh, and then went back to its normal expansion. That whoosh thing we call inflation, okay? And that kind of inflation, if it happens in a uh, multidimensional universe, it could happen over and over and over. So we could be, what we see right now is an inflation inflationary space-time within a larger, more than four-dimensional universe, or we could be this membrane bridging four-dimensional space-time in, again, something that's larger than what we would consider our universe. So, um, yeah, I'm sorry that I wish I could explain it a little bit uh, more graphically or, or more visually, but just imagine a flag, two flags fluttering in the breeze, and every once in a while one of them touches, a spot touches here or here, and we might be that touch point. Great answer. And you know, speaking of jingles, one of our listeners brought up a jingle. Jetsons, meet the Jetsons. <laughs> you mean they're the Flintstones? <laughs> meet yeah, George they're Jetson. Not, they're your modern <laughs> Stone Age family. I'm getting, I think I'm getting things mixed up From here. From the town yeah. of Bedrock, they're a place in London history, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, you got kind of like use, mass like, uh, <laughs> hypnosis there with the um, <laughs> mixing of the jingles. But <laughs> one of our listeners want to know, when are we going to get Warp Drive Jetson style? Or maybe he uh, meant Star Trek style. Yeah. Um, I don't, I, the Jetsons had flying cars. Uh, I don't know if they ever like went far away. They, they had um, 
extra galactic visitors. Of course, so did Fred Flintstone, right? The the great kazoo, was that his name? That showed up and visited yeah. Fred. Uh, but um, warp drive, as far as Star Trek goes, um, seems highly unlikely. Uh, I don't know when we're going to get that. There is a Mexican physicist, his name is Miguel Alcubierre, who about f a few decades ago anyway, I don't, I don't remember the exact date, but a few decades ago, came up with a mathematical structure to explain warp drive. What he basically hypothesized was, well, we've been talking about this four-dimensional space-time in which we exist, right? Now imagine if you could somehow create a pocket of space-time within the larger space-time. Remember I was saying that individual objects cannot move through space faster than the speed of light? What he said mathematically was that, well, a pocket of space-time can move faster than the speed of light in the larger space-time. So all you have to do is to surround whatever spaceship you want to fly in, in this sort of bubble, and thus you create this miniature space-time bubble that you can allow to fly through the universe at faster than the speed of light. So mathematically, that's a structure where you could actually create that. The only question is, can you actually engineer a, a thing that allows you to surround um, a spaceship with a bubble like that, right? In Star Trek, they use this fictional thing called dilithium, and they create uh, a bubble around them using warp nacelles and things like that which is kind of cool. Uh, but I don't know when we're going to get that. It'd be nice to get it in the year 2063. Uh, that's when we're supposed to get it, right? It, I'm not spoiling Star Trek First Contact for anybody, am I? <laughs> Smitty does a good Scotty. Don't you, don't you Smitty? <laughs> yeah, I did. Beam me up, Scotty. I mean, not Scotty. Scotty's the one beaming him up. Listen, <laughs> I've got a question. Do you, do you think time travel will ever be possible? Ah, the question is whether time travel backwards will ever be possible. We are all traveling through time right now. We're traveling forward, right? right. right? Yeah, time is, is an unusual dimension. When Einstein was working out the general theory of relativity in the 19 teens, he had to recognize, and this is part of the reason it took him so long to work out the math, he recognized that whereas we can go forwards and backwards in length, width, or height, we cannot go backwards in time. We can only go forward. There was a paper published, uh, I think a year or two ago, that gave a mathematical framework for the possibility of traveling backwards in time. Uh, but the problem is that our uh, history, the way that time works, we are dependent on causality. The fact that we go forward only in time allows us to mark things like ages, birthdays, uh, any kind of milestone, any kind of changes, whether on a subatomic or on a grandiose level, that's all dependent on causality. So if we move backwards, this mathematical paper that was published, I think somewhere in Australia, um, showed that even if you go backwards for a period of time, eventually your time always goes back to the causal thing that you were going to want to have been from in the first place. In other words, you travel backwards in time, you come back and things basically won't have changed uh, from when you left. Even though you might want to go back and change something cool, you can't do it. Uh, we don't know if that particular paper is correct from the physical perspective or you know, from the cosmological perspective, but it would be really interesting, wouldn't it, to be able to travel back in time. Uh, but it doesn't sound like we can change the past, even if we could. Wouldn't it be fun just to go back and just see stuff? You know, I think that would be super cool. Yes. It would. Where, where would you go back to? Where would your, your period in time, what would you travel oh, back to see? Wow. Um, geez, there's so many different points in time that I would be very interested in. Uh, I think one of the places I would love to go is uh, the Tang Dynasty which ran from AD 618 to 907. That was a period of time when some of the best poetry in the world was written, some of the most amazing cultural phenomena. Uh, most of the things that we associate with sort of classical Chinese culture and history originated 
roughly during the Tang Dynasty, uh, what we would consider the, the Middle Ages right, in Europe, right. right? And there was a flourishing civilization with all kinds of super stuff. I would love to just be a fly on the wall or spider under the table or whatever, uh, you know, and just see all that stuff happening, looking at the great poets and the great artists of that time, watching them do stuff. That would be super cool. That would be neat. It would be. Where would you two like to go? To, to bed. To bed every night. <laughs> and more, just more sleep is all I need at this point. <laughs> I don't need to go back in time. <laughs> None of my three children slept through the night until they were three years old or older. Oh, don't tell me that. <laughs> well, I understand your situation, but you know what? There's hope, CJ. But, but that's why I'm an astronomer, see? So guess, guess who amongst me and my wife was the one who got up with the kids every night for three years plus per child? Uh, but I didn't mind it. Oh. It was part of my job description. <laughs> you just went out and studied the stars, huh? When you <laughs> not a bad idea. The applause deserved. I've got new motivation to go look out at the universe at two thirty in the morning. <laughs> so to answer Smitty's question, I first I need to go forward. Wait, do I go forward to get a sports almanac, or do I go back to get a sports almanac? I can't remember, <laughs> but I need a sports almanac, oh. and then I'll go back before the sporting events with my sports almanac. That's where I want to go. Yeah. But he just said you can't change history. Wait a minute. Is, you can't change it. I can't see myself fading away on my photograph. I would get the sports almanac, go backwards, make a lot of money, invest in Apple, and then come back. That would be a win-win situation. Got to get right. back in time. That would be nice. We do not own the rights to that song. All right. Do we have any more listener questions we want to throw in there before we move on to hot takes, Tim? We we did have a a, a couple more listener questions real quick before we get to uh, hot takes, or if we're going to do any of the wheel of questions. Listener Jason Stifler wants to know, and I think this is a great question, Doctor Lou. If most galaxies have a black hole, and the black holes are gobbling the galaxies and the time and the expansion of the universe and they're all attracted to each other. When do we stop expanding and go back to the singularity? It's a wonderful question. Turns out as based on our observations of the universe right now, we're never coming back together. For some reason, space itself, as it expands, it gains space speed in its expansion. If it did not, if like for every cubic inch of space, there were not just a tiny, tiny bit of extra expansion energy built into it, then eventually, yes, all of the matter in the universe, not just the black holes, but all the stars, all the dark matter, which is way more massive put together than the stars, right, would eventually draw us down together. It would slow down our expansion and if it were enough, it would reverse the expansion and we would fall into something called the big crunch. As late as 20-ish years ago, that was a very real possibility. Our observations just weren't solid enough to know how much expansion power space had. But since about 1997, first uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope observations of nearby galaxies, then followed by measurements of the cosmic microwave background and its geometry, and then followed by cosmological um, distances measured by exploding stars called type 1a supernovae. All of that got put together. And we now are quite certain that space itself has so much power in its expansion that it's driving all the galaxies so far apart, it will overwhelm gravity. And within a few billion years, right, estimates range from one to a thousand billion years from now, all of those objects will be driven so far apart that there will no longer be any hope of pulling them back together again. This drive is often called dark energy, and it is three times more powerful than the gravity of even dark matter. So that's what's really driving the motion of the universe today. That's amazing. Wow, I just can't even fathom that. 
I think we maybe have time for one more listener question, if that's okay. Listener Willie Mounts wants to know, apparently some UNC graduate students, by the way, shout out Chapel Hill, home base for CJ and myself. Some UNC graduate students recently discovered a trove of black holes. What are your thoughts on that? Does it change any of the ideas in the cosmos explained? Where where are these black holes that these UNC wonderful people discovered? A trove of them? We don't know. Willie, find out for us and come on back. <laughs> Send us the info, Willie, and we'll circle back to well, that I question. Don't know. Well, well let, let me say that. Yeah, well, let me say it. First of all, uh, hooray for UNC Chapel Hill's uh, astronomy. I know some really, really good astronomers there. And, and some of them, uh, the more senior members, um, isn't there a Dean Smith Chair of Astronomy or Dean Smith Professor at UNC Chapel Hill, named after the, the famous coach, I believe? He endowed a chair. If not, there should be. Yeah. Anyway, the, the person who held that chair for many years, I don't know if he's still holding that chair, was an astronomer named Jim Rose, uh, who was a, a terrific guy. I hope Jim Rose was not the person who taught you astronomy uh, that made you sad, CJ. I'm sorry, that was the case. <laughs> I, I, did, I did not go to UNC for undergrad. She should have had the Michael Jordan <laughs> okay. chair of astronomy. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But, the, um, but uh, what happened was that Jim Rose uh, was doing some research, which I was very inspired by back when I was a graduate student. And so I sort of, sort of continued the work that he was doing, talking about what happens when the black holes in the galaxies um, wind up congealing because galaxies themselves are colliding. When the galaxies collide, they wind up streaming huge amounts of matter into the central black holes of these galaxies. And thus you can create this thing called a quasar, which is very, very powerful. A quasar can emit more light in one second than our sun could in a million years. You know, this is really, really powerful stuff. But eventually that information subsides and you wind up with a black hole just sitting there. In the middle of a galaxy. There's no reason why there can't be many such galaxies with many such black holes just slowly moving toward one another, eventually coming together. Um, it would not affect the way that our universe's history is going to work. Unfortunately, black holes simply don't have enough matter to affect the entire universe at any given time. They are powerful enough to affect entire galaxies. For example, the Milky Way galaxy in which we live is profoundly impacted by its supermassive black hole. But that dark energy expansion that's you now driven by this unexplained extra energy in space, uh, that will barely feel even a thousand black holes in a single spot. So I have to say, this is actually headline 15 hours ago. UNC Chapel Hill astronomers find hidden trove of massive black holes. Sheila Knappen and Magda Polamera have found a previously overlooked treasure trove of massive black holes in dwarf galaxies. 15 yeah. hours ago. Breaking news. Good for them. Good for Sheila. Uh, <laughs> um, the, 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 I think probably, based on that headline, if we're talking about is black holes in dwarf galaxies are the issue here. Yes. You see, our Milky Way galaxy is not a dwarf galaxy. It's often referred to as what's called an L-star galaxy, which means it is very large. Uh, it's amongst the top 5% of uh, galaxies in terms of the number of stars that it has. So it's actually quite large. And it's that kind of large galaxy that allows us to exist. Uh, where we are, because it provides the stable gravitational environment from which our sun can form, a solar system can form, and, and you're not going to, uh, say, get it torn apart by wildly moving stars back and forth. But dwarf galaxies, things that are, say, uh, a thousandth the mass of the Milky Way, that's a different story. With that small amount of matter, we don't know if there are a lot of black holes in them. Uh, a few years ago, uh, a scientist named Vivian Baldessari, uh, she was one of the first pioneers to confirm the existence of these sort of uh, intermediate mass black holes in dwarf galaxies. 
And since then, many, many other people have been studying in the Creedon. For example, Mallory Molina, who um, recently tried to use what are called coronal lines to find these black holes in dwarf galaxies. And I guess now Sheila and her colleagues have done the same thing, uh, finding even more galaxies. It's pretty amazing. You are incredibly knowledgeable about <laughs> so much. I can't believe how much you can just answer. Well, I, you know, I, I just love this stuff. Uh, I feel very fortunate knowing about the universe and, and the whole point of being an astronomer and, and being a scientist is, is being able to share that love of the universe with everybody. You know, no matter how much or how little we know, even a little bit is significant. It matters. Uh, we are, as, as I said before, as amazing and as ordinary as any star in the sky, any galaxy in the universe. And if we feel that and we share that with folks, uh, I think it's a lot of fun. It's a great way to make a living. I feel very lucky. Well, we are certainly lucky to have you on the show. And I think um, we should dive into some hot takes. To be continued. You've been listening to All Things Unexplained. If you liked this podcast, please do give us a five-star rating and leave us a review. If you would like to hear more All Things Unexplained, be sure to follow us wherever you listen to your podcasts. Our show depends on the support of listeners like you. Find us on Venmo under the business accounts. Just look for at Bigfoot UFO. Additionally, you can support us at buymeacoffee.com backslash unexplained. If you can't get enough of us, go ahead and check us out at allthings-unexplained.com. A special thanks to our producer, director, sound mixer, editor, and the man who wears far too many hats. No, seriously, he wears a lot of hats. Dr. Tim Mounts. Without you, we couldn't keep the lights on. Thanks for listening to All Things Unexplained.